yeah, today I'm going to be given um, a little kind of overview and presentation on a project I've been working on for a little while. Um, like Alex said, the title of the talk is Splicing Specific, specific Transcriptional Water Associations on Schizophrenia. Um, but before I get into that, I'm going to bore you all a little bit and go into some very basic uh, concepts. Um, to start, I wanted to talk a little bit about genetic variation and what that entails. Uh, genetic variation, uh, kind of what you can think about if you were to compare two humans, uh, even if they were siblings, you will be able to find different of, uh, um, million that they that their genomes differ in a uh, million of different ways. Um, if we look at these differences uh, in a multitude of ways, uh, some of them can be very small and can be at the single nucleotide resolution, which a lot of us study and they're called SNPs or SNVs, or they could be larger variations at the deletion insertion levels, but including multiple uh, nucleotides. As an example here, we have a reference genome at the top. Um, with a CG base, and then we have a SNP that transforms that into TA uh, complement. Um, these differences are actually, even though they look small, they can cause really big alterations in individual traits, and traits can be anything from height to something much more complex like a uh, disorder or the disease. Um, the way we've been studying these uh, recently has been through genome-wide association studies, and these are studies that are observational studies of the entire genome. And, and the entire valence within the genome. So another way to think about it is we can look at the genome of a specific trait and a specific population, and we can bend this population into cases and controls and look at the frequency that which this SNP is present. Um, in this uh, example here, the top row shows the cases, the bottom row shows the controls. And this, for this first SNP, we can see that the, sorry, that we can see that the frequency of the SNP is different, be, different between the cases and the controls, which tells us that this the frequency of the SNP might be related to the trait we're interested in studying. Um, and all of this is important, but it doesn't really tell us the molecular pathways by which these genetic variants are acting. Uh, so one of the ways that these generic var uh, genetic variants are acting is through RNA splicing. And traditionally, constitutive RNA splicing, the first example at the top, uh, is the molecular process of taking out introns from the expression of a gene and joining the exons to create a mature mRNA. But we have a different, a lot of different modalities of uh, RNA splicing, and this is what we call alternative RNA splicing, where we can, from the same gene, we can have different modalities like exonic skipping or inclusion, we can have alternative five prime, alternative three prime size, or we can even have intron rotation events, uh, which all of these cause for the same gene to have a multitude of different isoforms, creating a, a lot of more molecular diversity from the same gene. All of this comes into play with genetic regulation because recent studies have found, or relatively recent studies have found, that genetic variants associated with traits actually have a really big effect on splicing directly without any uh, intermediary uh, molecular pathways. And from there, mRNA splicing then has a big effect on complex traits. And complex traits is traits that involve a multitude of genes or are very complex in the regulation of their molecular signature. Um, this is all to uh, motivate kind of the beginning of the project and what I've called a gap between RNA biology and genetics. Um, so like I said, GWAS has linked genotypes to disease phenotypes or complex traits. Um, RNA biology has often focused on the generic regulation between the genetics and the RNA. And uh, more recently, uh, TWAS or transcriptome-wide association studies have identified uh, associations between genetics, the transcriptome, the gene expression, and a trait. Um, but the problem with this is we're skipping kind of what the nitty gritty of the RNA regulation entails. So what I propose and what I've been working on is to create a framework that kind of bridges this gap and goes from genetics to transcriptome to another RNA regulation and then links all of that to a trait. Um, so this is the basis for the study. And then I want to motivate uh, why we're looking at a specific trait uh, for this particular study. Um, so schizophrenia, schizophrenia is a complex and chronic mental disorder. It's characterized by hallucinations, delusions, disorganized uh, thinking and speech, 
amongst others. Um, it is highly genetic. Um, it's considered also a polygenic disorder, which involves a multitude of genes that could be dysregulated jointly or cause dysregulation through genetic patterns. Um, furthermore, alternative splicing is highly tissue specific and the brain being the tissue with the highest degree, which all of this combined um, makes neuropsychiatric disorders like schizophrenia, particularly interested to study through the combined lens of genetics and splicing. Um, so with all of that in mind, we decided to develop a new framework to study genetics through the splicing lens, which is something that hasn't done, hadn't been done uh, in a large scale before. Um, and this is the method we've dubbed as SPLITWAS, which stands for Spliced Transcription Wide Association Study. And this is kind of the overview of the framework. I'll be going step by step. Uh, not taking it too long on each step, but to get you through how the study was set up and um, the results we have. So first, to start with the framework, we need, of course, our inputs. Uh, Spokewas takes a relatively basic set of inputs. It relies on RNA-seq genotypes, GWAS summary statistics of the trade you're particularly studying, and then an LD reference panel, which can be easily accessible through a thousand genomes. So that's basically what we're, I'll be presenting on today. Um, I'll be uh, presenting on two schizophrenia data sets, uh, both from the Psych Code Consortium, one named the Brain GVEX data set and the other the Common Mind. Uh, both of these data sets are from dorsolateral prefrontal cortex brain tissue uh, that were sequenced. Uh, matching genotype data for both of these studies is available. Um, so we have pair RNA-seq data and genotypes for all of the samples I've uh, stated here. Um, and then on the GWAS side and the LD reference, we'll be looking at the PGC consortium. Uh, GWAS summary statistics, we have about, about 80,000 individuals between cases and controls. Uh, and the LD reference panel I'll be looking at is the 1,000 Genomes European Ancestry. Um, Mainly because, well, not mainly, uh, a big thing in doing these genetic studies is taking into account uh, ancestry. Um, and I've done, I've taken care of also taking into account ancestry for my RNA seq data set. Um, so, with this, uh, the first step we have is um, quantifying um, splicing. And this is something that we've uh, kind of has been missing between the RNA biology field and, and the genetics field. Uh, genetics have been looking at um, splicing in, in a multitude of ways while uh, the RNA biology field kind of has concentrated in, in looking at it through the lens of PSI. And I'll be talking a little bit more about that. Uh, so PSI stands for percent spliced in. And what it basically signifies is it looks at the inclusion of the exon um, individually in the transcript population of the gene. And the way to look at that and calculate it is, uh, as the two example I have here, we can focus on XN2 as one of the easiest examples. Um, your PSI is basically just going to be a ratio of your inclusion reads, so reads that include, that cover that um, exon, and then your exclusion reads, which are reads that include flanking regions of that exon. So basically events that you know are skipping the exon of interest that you're looking at. So in this case, we can see that in the reads one, two, or one and three include the exons, while read two skips the exon. Um, and then basically your PSI would be calculated between these two. Uh, of course, because RNA-seq and reads kind of tend to be noisy and there's a lot of other factors. We normalize these reads by the read length, uh, the feature length, which is the feature or the length of the exon. And then we add a little of a correction at the end of the reads if there's a little bit of an overhang. But basically taking these inclusion reads and exclusion reads, we can take a ratio. So the ratio would be your inclusion reads plus the total sum of your inclusion reads and your exclusion reads. This will give you a value between zero and one that takes that basically tells you the percentage uh, amount of time that your exon is being spliced into the transcript population of a specific gene. Um, this is really helpful, and this is a really good way to look at the alternative splicing of a particular exon. But for the purposes of our analysis, um, we have a little bit of a problem. 
Uh, PSI, like I said, is a value bound between zero and one and tends to have a very bimodal distribution with a lot of your values being uh, ones and a good amount of your values being zero or close to zero. The reason for this is there's a lot of constitutive exons, which will, of course, have a PSI value of one because they're always included in a transcript population of the gene. There's also alternative exons that will never be including depending on the tissue or the disease you're looking at, which is why you also have a lot of values around zero. For the assumptions that we need for our models moving forward, um, this presents a little problem because there's a linear alley assumption. And as you can tell, the PSI distribution is not normal at all. So what we kind of came up with, and this is a borrowing from the methylation field, is a little transformation that we've done, the S value transformation or splicing value transformation, which is basically just a log two transformation of the PSI with a little alpha correction to account for uh, particular spiders on the boundaries so of zeros and ones. Um, and then from here, we can transform our PSI values into S values, which are a value that is much more normally distributed and fits the assumptions that we're going to be using in building uh, our predictive models moving forward. So moving to our predictive models, the way we define our predictive models, um, sorry that the images are a little bit blurry, uh, but the way we define our predictive models are through a heritability window or a window where we build um, our, our SysNips or identify our SysNips. And in our case, and the example here to the left, uh, we have an exon as the little uh, pink block. Um, and the little stars that we have here are going to be CSNPs. And we add a little bit of a surrounding heritability window where we expect there to be genetic, genetic uh, regulation relating to our exon. In this ex toy example, I say 1KB. I'll be talking a little bit more about that, but we end up using a little harder or a larger window. Uh, so from here, what we can do is build a matrix of our SysNPs and our genotypes from the SNPs we're looking at and relate that to the splicing value uh, we've obtained from the quantification and transformation before. Uh, here we've used four different linear regression methods to calculate weights. We dub weights as a signature, but basically to calculate the effect size of each of these SysNPs on our splicing value. Um, in the locus of each of these exons. And the four different linear regression models we have used is LASSO, ENIT, TOP1, TOP1, which ends up being very equivalent to SQTL or EQTL, because it only takes the most significant SNP and BLUP, uh, which is a Bayesian method to, uh, and gives weights to all of the SNPs within the matrix. We then perform a five-fold uh, cross-validation to determine significant models to be used uh, moving forward. Uh, so from here comes a little bit of what the novelty is. Um, like I mentioned before, we've used GWAS summary statistics, or we use GWAS summary statistics, which tell us the relationship with this, between the SNP and the traits we're looking at um, and the effect size of those. And then from our predictive models, we were able to calculate the effect sizes between the SNPs and the splicing levels. So what we can do then is just do a linear combination between the z-scores of the SNP to trade associations and add the weights between the SNPs and our splicing values to cre then create a predicted exon usage to trade effect. So here we're going from genetics to splicing to an, a trade, kind of bridging the gap I had uh, mentioned and established early. Um, so from here, I'm going to delve a little bit uh, more into the results. Uh, as it's traditional with most genetic studies, GWAS and TWAS, uh, I'm showing here a genome-wide splicing associations for both of the cohorts with blue dots being for brain GVEX and uh, kind of uh, corally pink dots uh, being for the common mind consortium. We can see that there's quite a few uh, hits. All of these hits are at the exon level. And we can see that there's splicing signals that are particular uh, for each of the data sets, but there's a lot of concordance between both of the data sets. And then there's a lot of associations across the genome. Uh, looking a little bit more specific and quantitative ways at uh, these uh, associations, we find a total of 137 uh, exons associated in, in the brain data set, 
88 exons are associated in the common mind data set and 13 shared between the two. When we look at what genes these exons belong to, we have 84 genes associated and 67 uh, respectively between the two data sets and a shared between uh, and a higher proportion shared uh, of 24 genes. Uh, the reason for this is uh, because we have so many exons that we're texting, testing, uh, there tends to be a lot of exons that are almost at the boundary of uh, statistical significance but are not associated, but then tend to belong to the same gene, which is why we see a higher proportion of shared genes between the two cohorts. Um, taking a deeper dive at these genes, uh, we wanted to look at what biological pathways these range, uh, genes were enriched in. Um, so we did uh, gene ontology analysis. Um, genes on uh, the results on the left are for brain GBEX, the results on the right are for common mind. Um, we found that there's a lot of, uh, that there's a high level and significant enrichment in significant pathways to schizophrenia with uh, neurological development, um, neurogenesis, and um, synaptic transport being some of the terms that come up as enrichment. There's also uh, enrichment for immunological pathways within uh, these gene sets, associated gene sets like B cell activation. Um, amongst others. And this is uh, relatively consistent what the literature establishes that the pathways and hallmarks of uh, schizophrenia are. And especially it's uh, interesting to see immunological terms come up as a, it's been something that has been um, recent in the, in the kind of, of uh, development on on understanding these neuropsychiatric diseases that immunolo uh, immunological responses uh, could be largely responsible. Um, moving forward, we wanted to compare how our approach uh, kind of picked up the same signals or specific signals to traditional transcriptome-wide association studies. Um, and this is a, a comparison in the uh, simple Miami plot on the associations from the same data set. Um, for our method at the top and traditional TWAS at the bottom, we can see that we pick very similar loci across chromosomes uh, with a couple of signals being specific to TWAS and a couple of signals being very specific to uh, our method. Um, taking, uh, yes. Uh, and then moving forward from here, we wanted to see how the variance in the genes associated and the exons associated uh, that we found uh, kind of disrupted RNA, uh, protein RNA interactions. So we took a look and saw and studied how the variants that we uh, found to be associated through splicing, uh, whether they were enriched on in particular uh, RNA binding proteins and disrupting uh, RNA regulation through them. So what we found is that for both cohorts, there's a high level of uh, fold enrichment, and this was calculated as the degree of overlap from variants we found to be associated versus random controls uh, in a multitude of uh, RNA binding proteins. Um, with quite a couple of them, and not, not getting into too much detail, with a quite a couple of them being uh, RNA splicing vectors and others being transcriptional regulators as well as um, splicing factors uh, as well. Um, looking at a more overview between uh, and comparing this to uh, traditional TWAS and seeing whether we were picking a unique signal to our method or we're looking uh, at something that is overlapping in just regular transcriptional regulation, uh, we can see that for all of these, uh, for this cohort of um, RNA binding proteins, we have a higher fold enrichment in our method compared to um, TWAS. Um, so having found a, a big set of genes and exons that were um, particularly interesting, but having not necessarily uh, a particular direction to go and study them, uh, we also decided to kind of extend a method through of uh, fine mapping. Um, and this method is uh, named FOCUS, and, but traditionally it's only used at a, gen, uh, at a low side level, so at a genetic risk uh, Gene, sorry, gene uh, risk level, um, but we extended the method to fit kind of our approach of studying the splicing regulation through exons within 
um, at the Exxon to Splicing to Trade Association. Um, and the basis of the method is we can grab, we can use our splitwise associations and create a predicted splicing correlation matrix through kind of the overlapping SNPs and associations and loci that we were using for our predicted models um, and look at these uh, associations and apply this probabilistic fine mapping method uh, to tell us what exons within a same gene would be the ones driving the signal. Um, and then from this, we can also dub or look at the genes that could uh, potentially be driving the associational signal that we're seeing. What we find is that there's a much smaller subset of these putative uh, uh, exons and genes in both uh, data sets. I'm showing just a quick uh, bar graph on the counts of both of these um, of these methods. So from here, we had a good set of genes and exons that we could take a better look at and see how the genetic regulation was actually happening um, and how big this splicing signal uh, was. So we took a uh, look at a couple, but I'll be showing one particular example um, from a gene uh, called APOP1, which is uh, particularly related to an apoptosis uh, a regulatory pathway. Um, and for this particular gene, we had two exons, which are the ones highlighted through the dotted lines that were associated. And when we took a look at the distribution of their splicing through um, their genotypes, we can see that the splicing of the exon actually increases as uh, we go through our, geneti our genotype. Um, so from reference to her zygous to variant, we can see a high increase on both of the exons, on the splicing in of these two particular exons. But when we look at uh, the distribution through genotype uh, by gene expression, it's actually pretty flat and it's not very informative. So this is one of the genes that was particularly interesting and was specifically picked up through this splicing signal uh, when compared to gene expression. So kind of to conclude, um, we presented, uh, here I present TWAS, uh, which is a novel framework that integrates uh, alternative splicing and genetic trait associations, uh, bridging one of the, the gap between RNA biology and genetics. Um, we've I've identified a multitude of exons and genes with significant associations in schizophrenia. Uh, we've provided compelling evidence of uh, the involvement of splicing regulation as a candidate mechanism. Uh, for underlying certain disease-associated loci. Um, split was, even though I only showed it applied to schizophrenia, is applicable to any complex trait, but it's particularly useful for those associated with abundant occurrences of alternative splicing. Um, with that, I want to acknowledge and thank both of my mentors, Dr. Gray Shao and Dr. Basanik, um, and then in particular, a couple of members in the lab who've made uh, all of this work possible. Um, I'm realizing I, this is a little bit of an outdated acknowledgement slide. Uh, uh, Giovanni, Mudra, and Kofi are actually full doctors now. All uh, have graduated and have helped me quite, quite a bit uh, in my journey in, in this project. Um, and then I want to thank Jack as well for contributing to this work. And then Arjun from uh, the Box On Lab. And with that, um, thank you for your attention and I'm ready to take any questions.